This is the City of College Park's annual tribute to Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. For this year's theme, we have chosen Injustice Anywhere is a Threat to Justice Everywhere in order to try to influence folks that we are all one group and we need to work together so that justice is served. We need to perpetuate and inform younger generations of Dr. King's legacy and his teachings. This event is so important because it's a continuation of celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King, who has guided so many of us through hard times and good times. I am standing on the shoulders of him, and now generations to come after me will also see the, the work and the sacrifice that Dr. King has made. We needed to honor Dr. King. We need to honor our brothers in the struggle, our sisters in the struggle, and each other um, as a collective in our tribe. Because it goes to the heart of who we are as Americans and, and really the world, and about freedom, justice, inequality, fairness, and how we live up to the standards that Dr. Martin Luther King and many others fought and died for in our country. Good afternoon. I am Colin Pugh, your host for this evening. I'm a pastor, youth pastor at Kettering Baptist Church. This is an incredible honor to be with you at this tribute to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. I'm truly grateful and thankful for Dottie Chiquillo for inviting me and, the ho and, and to be your host, and also to the wonderful committee. This tribute to Dr. King started in 1991 with the Social Activist Committee of Lakewood Civil Association. Over the years, members of the planning committee grew to embrace members of several faith-based groups, including Embry AME Church in Lakewood, the Metropolitan Washington Baja Community, and the First Baptist Church of College Park. With the vision of the planning committee to extend this wonderful event citywide, Thama Lomax and Sue Rushworth, Rushworth Worth approached the city for use of the council chambers and financial support. In addition, the planning committee want to thank the city, the University of Maryland, the National Archives, and the and Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission for their support as well. As we continue the celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King, please give your attention to this video of the life of Dr. King. Today we're going to learn about the civil rights leader, Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr., best known for his nonviolent protests and speeches calling for equality for all people, was born on January 15, 1929, in Atlanta, Georgia. He was the second of three children, born to a Baptist preacher. At the time, Less than 70 years after slavery was made illegal in the United States, things were still hard for black Americans. Many people were unhappy when slavery was ended, and lawmakers in some places, especially southern states, made special rules to keep white people and black people apart. People of different races had to use different drinking fountains, different bathrooms, and even had to go to different schools. The Supreme Court ruled that it was legal as long as things were separate but equal. This separation between people of different colors was called segregation. This was the atmosphere that young Martin Luther King grew up in. He attended a segregated school where he did so well that he was able to skip two grades and graduate at the age of 15. Shortly after graduating, he began studying at Morehouse College and he graduated with a degree in sociology in 1948. He 
had decided to become a minister like his father, and so he enrolled in a seminary to study religion. In 1951, Martin Luther King Jr. graduated from the seminary, the top in his class. On June 18, 1953, King married Coretta Scott, with whom he would have four children. He continued his education by studying for his doctorate at Boston College, and in 1954 he became the pastor of a Baptist church in Montgomery, Alabama. In 1955, he received his Ph.D. when he was only 25 years old. In December of 1955, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus to a white man, for which she was arrested and spent the night in jail. Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders organized a boycott of the bus system. This meant that the people who wanted things to change would stop riding the bus. The Montgomery bus boycott lasted over a year, and so many people refused to ride the buses that the bus companies lost a lot of money. In December of 1956, the Supreme Court ruled that segregated buses were unconstitutional. This was a major victory for the civil rights movement, and it proved that peaceful methods could create change. However, many people were upset by the changes that were happening, and Martin Luther King was nationally recognized after his part in the bus boycott. He was jailed over 20 times, stabbed, his house was bombed, and he was frequently threatened, but he never stopped calling for equality. Between 1957 and 1968, King worked tirelessly to promote civil rights. He traveled all over, giving thousands of speeches, writing five books and many articles. His hard work and speaking ability earned him respect and a personal meeting with President John F. Kennedy. Of all his speeches, his most memorable was the I Have a Dream speech, delivered on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in 1963 to a listening crowd of 250,000 people. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. That year, Martin Luther King was named Time Magazine's Man of the Year, and in 1964 he received the Nobel Peace Prize. Around the same time, partially as a result of his efforts, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act, which made segregation and discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin illegal. King gave his final speech on April 3rd, 1968. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. The next day, while he was standing on his hotel balcony, Martin Luther King Jr. was shot and killed. He was 39 years old. In 1983, President Ronald Reagan signed a bill creating a national holiday to remember King's life and accomplishments. Martin Luther King Jr. Day is celebrated on the third Monday every January in honor of the man whose dream of peace and equality helped change a nation. I hope you enjoyed learning about Martin Luther King Jr. today. Goodbye till next time. Wasn't that an informative piece? I'm sure that we all, you can applaud. I'm sure we all got a few great reminders and learned something new about Dr. King. This group coming up next has performed annually since 2008. SGI, known as Soka, and excuse me for pronouncing the name if I mess it up, Soka Gakia Gakai as an American Buddhist Society for Value Creation. 
dedicate to peace, culture, and education. Now we will hear several selections by the SGI New Century course, accompanied with one of our own committee leaders, Lala uh, Lalia Sutton. Lila Sutton.
a new day. Oh, today I am winning. Filled with joy. So much joy. I feel in my life. What an inspiration. Let's give them another round of applause. <laughs> SGI, New Century Course, directed by Sister Marlene Fox. For the third year in a row, this talented group of young people has been with us and blessed us with their talent and their gifts. Put your hands together for the talent group for children under the direction of Mark Joyers. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good, that's good. Well, um, since I'm a part of Talent Group for Children, I just want to give a big shout out to the Clarice for having us perform. I'm very blessed. So, my name is Kelvin Dukes, and since it's the Martin Luther King Jr. Remembrance Day, I was thinking maybe I should sing something about change, or that a change might come. Actually, no. A change is gonna come. So I decided I was going to sing an a cappella version of A Change Is Gonna Come by Sam Cooke. <laughs> I was born by the river in a little tent. Oh, and just like the river, I've been running ever since. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change is gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. But then I thought more and more about something, something that can change the world, you know? Something like, hmm, that I don't give up. I'm not going to give up. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sing a song that called, I Don't Give Up. All right, here we go. I 
don't really wait. Oh, I messed up. I messed up. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Woo. I don't know what that was. Mm. I just can't give up now I've come too far from where I started from Nobody told me the road would be easy and I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. Thank you, thank you. Well, now for my last song, change has come. And you know what we're gonna do about that? We're gonna celebrate by having a happy day. So now to perform a happy day, here's Kelvin Dukes. All right. <laughs> La 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 la
Now, coming up to the stage, it's a wonderful, amazing step team. talented group of children. Let's give it up for them.
Last time I tried to do any of that, stepped too hard and I tore ligaments in my foot. <laughs> Boy, youth is a, a good thing to have, amen? At this time, we would have um, Metropolitan Washington of Baja Corral uh, was formed over 30 years ago. The group performed music based upon the writers of uh, ba Bahoala, founder of Baja Faith, that promotes the unity of all mankind throughout the United States and Canada. Put your hands together for the Metropolitan Washington of Baja Corral under the direction of Royal Bowman. The first song that we're going to do tonight is called If We Ever Needed Love. Um, and in it is a quotation from Baha'u'llah, who is the founder and prophet founder of our religion. Um, and in it the quotation says, Glory not in this that you love your country, but glory in this that you love mankind.
My love can in no wise reach thee. Know this, O servant. I give up, I give up on hate. I give up on hate. I give up, I give up on hate. I give up on hate. Won't you love me? Love me that I may love thee. If thou lovest me not my Love me, love me that I may love thee. Love thee. If thou lovest me not, my love can in no wise reach thee. Know this, know this, O oh servant. Know I give up, give up on hate. I give up, I give up, I give up on hate. I give up, give up on hate. Won't you love me? Love me that I may love thee. If thou lovest me not, my love can in no wise reach thee. Love me. That I may love thee. If thou lovest me not, my love can in no wise reach thee. Know this, know this, O oh servant. Know I give up on hate. I give up. I give up on hate. I give up. I give up. I give up on hate. I give up. I give up on hate. Won't you love me? Love me that I may love thee. If thou lovest me not, my love can in no wise reach thee. Love me that I may love thee. If thou lovest me not, my love can in no wise reach thee. I give up, I give up, I give up on hate. I give up, give up on hate. We give up, give up, I give up on hate. We give up, we give up on hate. In the uneasy times that we are living in, songs like that are refreshing. 
Let's give the Metropolitan Washington Baja Corral another round of applause. <laughs> Wonderful job. Before College Park Mayor Patrick Wogan joins us to present the city, city's official proclamation, give your attention to this brief video clip of Dr. King speaking directly to our theme, Injustice Anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Those who say to me, stick to civil rights, I have another answer. Others can do what they want to do. That's their business. If other civil rights leaders, for various reasons, refuse or can't take a stand or have to go along with the administration, that's their business. But I'm a saying that. That I know that justice is indivisible. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Uh, I want to read a quote by Victor Hugo uh, that, that music expresses that which cannot be put into words uh, and that which cannot remain silent. And uh, I want to uh, give a special round of thanks to the, all the musical acts who are, that are performing here today uh, and expressing uh, what cannot be put uh, so easily into words uh, about the life and legacy of, of Dr. King. So let's give uh, our musical groups a round of applause. And uh, there are several people that I, I want to thank before I read our proclamation. Uh, in particular, we have a very hardworking group of people that uh, work to put this event together every year. And they have done such a great job year after year bringing so many moving and entertaining, entertaining uh, uh, groups together and thoughtful speakers. Uh, uh, that uh, the committee includes uh, Lila Sutton, uh, Dottie Cicello, uh, Jordan Shackner and Anita Wally, uh, Council Member Monroe Dennis uh, from District 2, uh, our Mayor Pro Tem from the City of College Park, uh, is also involved. And we have several staff members who, uh, from the city who are involved as well. Uh, Sharon Fletcher, uh, Paula Green, Bob Ryan, and Rena Quinones. Let's give them a round of applause. And I want to especially note uh, one person who unfortunately couldn't, could not be here today, uh, but without whom uh, over so many years this event would not be, po would, would not be possible, would never have happened. Uh, and that is a, a co-founder of the event, an honorary member of the Martin Luther King Jr. Planning Committee, uh, and that is uh, Thelma Lomax. And now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to read uh, the following proclamation uh, that the uh, City Council put into the record at our meeting this past Tuesday, uh, quoting the theme of this year's annual tribute to Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Injustice Anywhere is a Threat to Justice Everywhere. The proclamation reads as follows. Whereas Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. practiced nonviolent action to promote equal rights and economic justice worldwide, and whereas Dr. King's many notable speeches, sermons, and writings are among the most revered orations and writings in the nation's history, and whereas the city acknowledges the civil rights movement in the United States of the 1950s and 1960s, which argued the, that the injustices, which argued the injustices of undermining America's claim as a society of peace and justice, and whereas. Dr. King and many other civil rights leaders chose to organize their arguments around the contra contrasting ideas that the United States was a leader in promoting democracy and rights while denying those rights to blacks living in America. And whereas Dr. King addresses his letter from the Birmingham jail to a small group of clergymen that communication was then shared with people across the nation stressing the interconnectedness of all. And whereas it was in the letter from the Birmingham jail that Dr. King stated, quote, darkness can't drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate can't drive out hate, only love can do that. Urging people to work towards these changes to secure justice for all. And whereas members of the greater College Park community strive to achieve the many visions of Dr. King, who said that, quote, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. 
We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Now, therefore, be it resolved that on Saturday, January 12, 2019, the Mayor and Council of the City of College Park join in recognizing the social and spiritual accomplishments of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. in the 28th Annual College Park Tribute that will carry forward the spirit and feeling of hopefulness and strengthen the promise of new beginnings. Be it further resolved that the theme of this year's tribute shall be Dr. King's enduring statement that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So proclaimed this 8th day of January 2019, St. Patrick L. Wyon, Mayor, City of College Park, Maryland. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Patrick Wyon. Now, to provide another perspective of our theme, today's keynote speaker, Melvin C. High, is elected sheriff for uh, Prince George's County, Maryland. Sworn in as sheriff on December the 7th, 2010, he is responsible for leading, managing, and commanding more than 300 deputies and civilians in safety and crime prevention efforts to protect and serve the citizens of Prince George's County. Sheriff Hyde came to the county after serving as the chief of police for Prince George's County in two, to 2003 through 2008 in Norfolk, Virginia from 1993 to 2003. He uh, revised recruitment and strategies brought the Norfolk Department to full staffing and increasing the number of women, African Americans, and civilian professional staff. Sheriff Hyde holds a Bachelor's of Science degree um, in biology from Tennessee State University and a master in business in public administration from Southern, Southeastern University in Washington, D.C. He is also a graduate of the FBI National Academy. Sheriff Hyde is a recipient, a recipient of many prestigious awards, including the Martin Luther King Jr. Family Life Institute in 1998 Real Dream Award. Sheriff Hyde resides in Upper Marlboro, Maryland, um, with his wife, Brenda, and has one daughter, Tracy. Now, give you a round of applause for our keynote speaker, Melvin C. Hyde. Thank you for that good introduction. Let me first say good afternoon to everyone. As I was introduced, my name is Melvin Hyde. And it's my pleasure to be with you today as we remember and celebrate the life and legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I want to thank the mayor and the council and certainly the College Park's Martin Luther King Day Committee for your invitation to be with you and share thoughts with you on this honored, monumental, and consequential historical American and world figure, and what he meant to worldwide justice. We know, of course, that your theme today are words written by Dr. King in his letter from a Birmingham jail. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Let us take a moment to think about what is justice and the opposite, injustice. And by whom are these defined? In America, as our Constitution has evolved by amendment, amendments, it has sought to define the rights of individual citizens and has influenced legal precepts from city halls to state houses throughout America on the subject of justice and injustice. However, the feelings and desires of individual citizens speak to and shape their own view of justice and injustice. And from a third perspective, from time to time and from region to region, 
the majority culture may simply informally define justice and injustice. For instance, I was born and grew through my teenage years in the 1950s and 1960s on a farm in rural Mississippi where I had firsthand experience with segregation, race-driven terror, and hatred. As people of color, we lived life as second-class citizens, where Jim Crow and denial of constitutional rights were a part of daily existence. The opportunity to pay tribute to Dr. King is an opportunity to pay tribute to a man who has influenced the choices I would make in my life. Because of good fortune, I was one of the lucky black Mississippians to attend college. As noted in my introduction, I attended Tennessee State University, where I received a great education. Tennessee State University, however, was like most tightly controlled black colleges and universities in the South at that time, they would not let controversial figures, particularly controversial black speakers, speak on campus. As I look back on that time, I realized the motivation for that was to prevent the budding civil rights movement, access to human resources to fuel the growing movement and unrest. In the early years of the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King Jr. was the first president of the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which he envisioned in January 1957 in the immediate aftermath of the hard-won victory of the Montgomery bus boycott, which ended in December 1956. SCLC was recruiting students on campuses throughout America, but particularly in the South. They stopped at Fisk University, and TSU students were unofficially invited to meet to hear Dr. King at that university. I went to that meeting, and I met Dr. King personally and got to shake his hand. I got to hear him speak about the movement for civil rights and why it was important. It is so clear to me now why Dr. King focused so much on making sure people understood the importance of the movement. Because understanding the movement meant also understanding the reasons to take the risk of engaging in nonviolent civil disorder, especially in the 50s and 60s. That explanation would come back to us again and again, as it did in his letter from a Birmingham jail, a letter he wrote to fellow clergymen, some of whom had called his activities in Birmingham unwise and untimely. Dr. King knew, of course, that their criticism was not born of ill will, but rather of a lack of understanding, and he set out in the letter to explain his actions. In the letter, he essentially says to them that while he knows they don't like the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham, he hasn't heard their equal concern about the conditions in the city that brought on the demonstrations. He writes to them, and I quote, I'm sure that none of you would rest content with the superficial kind of social analysis that deals merely with effects and does not grapple with underlying causes, end of quote. So while he might agree that demonstrations in Birmingham are unfortunate, he also thinks it is even more unfortunate that the city gave the community no alternative. What is it that Dr. King and those fighting for civil rights put at risk? We seldom talk about that, but if we give it some thought, we can easily see that they risk everything. They risk jail, of course, 
and with jail a criminal record, which could very well mean a loss of future employment and income and create a homeless existence. They risk even the loss of life, given the tactics used by law enforcement at the time, particularly at that time in the South and certain other regions in our country. They also risk potentially violent opposition from groups like the Ku Klux Klan and even regular citizens in the community, which would lead to injury and death. Dr. King's inspirational talks led many of us to engage in sit-ins at lunch counters throughout the South. The experience is one that became a major factor in my choosing a law enforcement career. I saw firsthand how racism and corruption in policing could ruin the lives of good people. I became a police officer because I knew that policing without fairness and justice was just another form of slavery. I wanted to be a part of changing that reality. After I served as a Marine in Vietnam, I returned to Washington, D.C., where I joined the Metropolitan Police Department. At that time, there were few blacks hired by the department and virtually no blacks in any important leadership positions. Fortunately, I joined the uh, Metropolitan Police Department as the political climate was changing in Washington as well as throughout the nation. And that change opened up new opportunities for advancement. And I came under the tutelage of the first African-American chief of Washington, Bertel M. Jefferson. I quickly learned as a beat cop that if I treated people with courtesy, respect, and fairness, I could impact the administration of justice in those communities that I served. As I moved up the ranks, I trained and mentored other officers to have an even further impact on communities and on my profession. I learned to lead by example. In this way, my career in law enforcement positioned me to be an advocate against police injustice everywhere. And I've always used my experience to promote cultural and gender diversity in law enforcement. Outside of the influence of my mom and dad and Dr. King, there's been only one other man that has had a similar impact on my life and the pursuit of justice. That man was Nelson Mandela. I had the privilege of first meeting Mandela in the early months after his release from prison when he came to Washington, D.C. at the invitation of our national government. During that visit, Mr. Mandela continued his fitness routine of taking long walks, which he began while in prison, where he would walk around in his cell and in the prison yard. But now, his walks occurred in open spaces. On his visit to America, he would arise early and leave the St. Regis Hotel at 16th and K Streets for his early morning walks. I had the privilege of accompanying him on many of those walks as part of his security team. And Mr. Mandela openly shared his thoughts about justice and the things that inspired him to risk his life for racial harmony and freedom in South Africa. I wonder how many of us ever think back on what was risked for future generations by Dr. King and those men and women, most whose names we'll never know, who fought against injustice by engaging in civil disorder. I think on it often, and I know that what they did was risk their lives. As we began 2019, I think that sometimes we all get distracted by our focus on possessions and the concerns of daily life. In my opinion, however, the struggle for justice and human dignity must continue and we must be willing to make the sacrifices necessary to make a better society a reality. I also think that we live in a time where we must think more broadly about injustice and how it relates to one's personal existence and our right to personhood. In my business, I've seen so many people made victims of crime 
that cross lines of race, religion, gender, national origin, and class. Sadly, even within the Catholic faith where I worship, people have been individually abused as if they have no right to control access by others to themselves or their bodies. In my view, every human being has a right to personhood and human dignity. That is what the Black Lives Matter movement is saying. Not that black lives are more valuable than others, but that they are most certainly equally as valuable, so why doesn't it look that way? They were willing to risk civil disorder. That's what the Me Too effort is saying. That women who are victims of sexual abuse and assault don't have to suffer alone and in silence because other women have mustered the courage to stand with them. They're willing to launch a movement to talk openly about things they'd been urged to keep quiet about. That's what Time's Up is saying. Not that women's lives are of greater value in our society than men's lives, but they are certainly equally as valuable and that our society can no longer pretend it doesn't know that abuse of power and instruments like non-disclosure agreements sanction the actions of powerful men to support the devaluation of women in multiple ways. They have been willing to come forward and risk ridicule by doing the forbidden of pointing the finger at a powerful man to be treated equally. I thought recently of the victory in Florida during the midterm elections that will restore voting rights to some 1.4 million Florida ex-felons. That law went into effect this week on January 8th. It is a law to celebrate. And I know from his perch in heaven, Dr. King is celebrating that. It bends the moral universe back towards justice. We cannot simply say what we are. We must be who we say we are. When did we decide to permanently disenfranchise people who commit a crime even though we say that serving their time is the cost of being restored to the community. That is what restorative justice is. Nothing happened that changed the fact that they are still citizens of our country. This is a lesson and legacy of the life of Dr. Martin Luther King. These social justice movements take their inspiration from the lessons and accomplishments of the civil rights movement and black freedom struggle. It is these movements and countless others that give life to Dr. King's belief that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it ultimately bends towards justice. And so we must consider, as Dr. King suggested to the clergy, whether we will pretend to be content with a superficial kind of analysis that deals merely with the effects of injustice or whether we will grapple earnestly with the underlying causes in order to see where real change can occur. Finally, I would share with you a sign of hope. Just recently, reporter Patula Dovrick writes about a middle school aged black hockey player playing out of an ice rink in Odenton, Maryland. The only black player on his team who was apparently well regarded by his white teammates. However, he underwent torrential racial hazing by team members and the parents and fans of a Pennsylvania team they were playing recently. The referees and coaches did nothing to stop the verbal assault, so his teammates came to his aid and a fight broke out. So, what did the game authorities do? they suspended the young black player for the rest of the tournament. Apparently, they assumed incorrectly that this young player would be abandoned by his teammates and his team's parents and fans, but he was not. His white teammates told their parents about the incident and a 100% protest by the parents, fans, and his teammates regarding the treatment of this young player was begun. What would you do? 
Justice requires that we not remain silent during the mistreatment of ourselves or others. I believe right accompanied by courage will overcome injustice everywhere. If only we stand up and take the risk. Thank you. Thank you so much for your words of encouragement this afternoon. Melvin High, Sheriff, in appreciation of your appreciation in this 28th annual City of College Park tribute to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., we present this to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And Happy New Year to everybody. Thank you so much, Sheriff Hyde, for that inspiration of words, encouragement, and a reminder of what we can do as individuals as we stand on the shoulders of Dr. King. At this time, this group that is coming up next has participated in this event since 1999. The Quaker School founded on the belief that every ch child has a uh, valuable, uh, every child is a valuable member of our community. Put your hands together for Friends Community Schools led by Kristen Whitehead. Whitehead. <laughs>
What a wonderful performance. Just beautiful voices. Let's give them another round of applause. <laughs> Friends Community School, thank you so much for blessing us with your lovely voices. At this time, we will have Makiko Tagucha, who is a representative of the Women's Federal for World Peace, will perform Fritz Kirsten. We'll perform Fisk Curitan and um, Rodino and Gershwin, It Ain't Necessary So, accompanied by Ottoman Weinman.
Wow, we have been on a journey. Wonderful time, wonderful event. So grateful to be here. How many of y'all join yourselves here today? We have experienced great video showing the life of Dr. King. We have witnessed SGI, talented group of, of children, Metropolitan, Washington, Baja, Corral. We have heard a great speech by uh, Sheriff High. We had a uh, Friends Community School chorus come up. And we just had uh, Makiko, violinist, and um, Mr. Wiseman, uh, pianist, and now for our last presentation for today. We have the Belly Dancers of Color Collective from the Mama Sita studio in the DMV performing a piece entitled Sweet Sister Freedom. We will not bow down to our racism. We will not bow down to injustice. We will not bow down to exploitation. I'm going to stay.
thankful for all the presenters today at this wonderful event. And at this time, we will have somebody come up from the Dr. Martin Luther King Tribute Committee. Is diversity beautiful or what? Let's give the all the participants another hand of applause. On behalf of the Martin Luther King Tribute Committee and the Mayor of College Park, we would like to thank you, Pastor Pugh, for introducing all of our guests, for making them feel special, and especially for making the audience feel special. So thank you again, and uh, we just have this small token of appreciation. So the person who was just speaking was Sister Dottie Chikilo. And I, I said, you set me up. She told me, I got a small job I want you to do. But I'm so grateful to be your host. I'm, I hope you had a great time today. And I just want to um, ask for a round of applause for the committee. If the committee, can you stand or show your face just because I know it only been an hour long event, but this take months and months of planning of meetings, of emails, and everything, and they did a phenomenal job getting everybody collectively to come together for this event so we can present to you Dr. Martin Luther King tribute by College Park. Also, we want to extend a, a, a great thank you to Hollywood Elementary School of Arts um, that, um, and the art teacher that uh, when you processed in today into the, uh, this beautiful uh, theater um, on display, uh, our young people from um, Hollywood um, Elementary School uh, did artwork. Um, please, uh, as we leave, please take your time to visit their art station. I'm just so grateful for them as well. Let's give them a round of applause. On behalf of the Dr. Martin Luther King, um, tribute committee. We want to thank you all for participating uh, with us today. Thank y'all so much for coming out and as you leave out we ask that you stay around because we do have refreshments. See y'all later. Good night.